forsaking the beautiful sunshine, or for some uh, revising from uh, and mock exams, for joining us for this penultimate public lecture of the year at the Von Hugel Institute for Critical Catholic Inquiry. In a way, today, it might seem we're taking a break from our theme for the year, Catholicity, Crises and Opportunities, question mark, to zoom in and look more closely at the ecclesiastical institutional phenomenon of Roman Catholicism, which tries, sometimes better, sometimes worse, to embody that key idea of Catholicity we're pursuing in our two-year series. But I suspect that won't actually prove to be the case. I think we'll just be taking a more interesting route to it. The Institute, and indeed the College, is hugely honoured to welcome Sir Anthony Kenny today. As the poster rightly says, Sir Anthony is one of the most eminent scholars of our time, with over 40 books to his name, ranging over the philosophy of mind, the thought of Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, and Wittgenstein, and much more. He has been Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Oxford, both Master of Balliol College and Warden of Rhodes House in Oxford, as well as Chair of the British Library and President of the British Academy. But for our purposes today, it is also Sir Anthony's own life which is key in addition to his scholarship. As he recounts in the first part of his fascinating three-part autobiography, A Path from Rome, he was brought up a Roman Catholic, was a seminarian at the English College in Rome, ordained a priest in 1955, and ministered in Liverpool for several years. Having completed a doctorate at St. Bennett's Hall in Oxford, and that's where we first met some years ago, his glittering academic career took off along with some doubts about elements of Catholic doctrine, and he left the priesthood in 1963. But since then, he has remained a very good, faithful, and helpfully critical agnostic friend of Catholicism. So we've been hugely looking forward to his talk today. Thank you, Sir Anthony, for travelling from the other place to talk with us. The usual practicalities, Sir Anthony will talk for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have our usual time for questions and comments, about 20 minutes, and then we'll uh, continue the conversation over there over a glass of wine. For those who are interested, there is a sung Latin mass, the last of this year, in the chapel at 6.15 with Bird's five-part mass setting. And finally, I must remind you that this is a public event and that we will be taking some photographs and indeed some video for our website. It's the first time we're using the, our new VHI camcorder. Um, but if you would prefer your uh, smiling face not to appear on our website, please let either me or Lydia know at the end. So without further ado, please welcome Sir Anthony Kenny to address the topic, The Pros and Cons of Catholicism. A uh, friend of mine a few days ago uh, was going up to the podium to give a lecture, and uh, he was asked by the host, uh, do you use audiovisual aids? And the lecturer said, that's none of your business. <laughs> uh, so, as a, as a certified dinosaur, I adjure a PowerPoint, and uh, I'm afraid you just have to make do with the handout. I hope you Everyone has got a copy of the uh, and uh, I <coughs> begin uh, with a, a bit of autobiography. Uh, I entered the junior seminary of the Liverpool Archdiocese in 1943 at the age of 12, remained there for six years. And we were prepared there for the national examinations, then called school certificate and higher certificate. The regime was quite austere. We rose at six for meditation and mass in chapel. After breakfast, there were classes till lunchtime, followed by compulsory soccer in winter and compulsory cricket in summer. In the evening, after recitation of the rosary, there was an hour and a half of study until supper at 7.15. Recreation followed until night prayers at 9.15 and we slept in individual cubicles in a vast 60-bed dormitory. 
and between night prayers and breakfast, there was a rule of absolute silence, the magnum silentium. It was only many years later that I realized what a very good education I was given at Apollo in the hands of the priests who taught us there, who taught classics. Most of them were Cambridge graduates. And during my last years in the school, after I learned to read Greek and Latin on my own, I, with two others, were exempted from any classwork. We were left to study alone in the library. <coughs> we were encouraged to draw up our own reading lists among the classical authors. And once the list had been approved, we were on our honour not to make use of translations. All we had to do was to make notes on our reading and once a week discuss it in a tutorial. By this, by this way, by the time I left Apollon, I had read uh, all of Homer, Herodotus, Thucydides, the Greek tragedies and so on, as well as a vast amount of Latin. Now, many years later, having published translations of Greek texts and books on Aristotle, I still acknowledge my debt to the humane and enlightened method of instruction in the junior seminary, because all the Greek I've ever learned, I learned there, I have no degree in Greek. But after completing my studies at the junior seminary, I was sent to the English College in Rome. And the seminary training there lasted seven years, a three-year course of philosophy followed by a four-year course of theology at the Gregorian University. Students were allowed home only once during those seven years in the gap between philosophy and theology. Some of the vacations in the other years were spent in a villa on Lake Albano uh, called Palazzolo. Students at the Gregorian University were housed in national colleges uh, scattered around Rome, uh, wearing cassocks of different colours to mark uh, their nationality. The educational experience at the Gregorian was not as good as that at uh, Apollo. It consisted of compulsory Latin lectures given to audiences of hundreds of students packed into tiered benches in a vast amphitheatre. The course conformed to a pattern of studies laid down by Pope Pius XI. Many of the Jesuits who <coughs> taught there were very learned men, but it took enormous gifts, uh, which few of them possessed, to be able to inspire students within the constraints of the medium and the curriculum. From 49 to 52, I was instructed in Thomistic philosophy. But the course involved almost no study of Aquinas' own writings, only of textbooks written by our professors. I found much of the philosophy unintelligible and repulsive. In particular, the proofs offered of the existence of God seemed totally unconvincing. I began to have doubts about the whole Christian theistic structure. <coughs> but I overcame the doubts sufficiently to be ordained a priest in 1955. There followed two years as a graduate student in theology, one year in Rome and one in Oxford, and then four years as a curate in Liverpool. And it became clear to me that I had made a terrible mistake in becoming a priest. I continued to find it difficult to attach a clear sense to many of the doctrines of the church that, as a priest, I was committed to holding. Moreover, one doctrine that had come to the forefront of the church's moral teaching in those years was the wrongness, the sinfulness of contraception. I could see little force in the natural law arguments used in support of it. But now that I was hearing confessions, and giving pastoral advice, I was obliged to constantly repeat and enforce the doctrines. Doubts about this point of faith were different from 
most other doubts. Because if the other doctrines that I doubted turned out to be false, then in general nobody was a loser but myself. But in a case like this, it was others who were paying the price if my advice was wrong. At the time of the Second Vatican Council, I at last faced up to the impossibility of my position and told the Archbishop, uh, Archbishop Heenan, that I wanted to be laicized. I told him that I thought in the long run it was unlikely I would remain a Catholic any more than remain a priest, but I'd like to depart in stages. Once laicized, it was possible that I would discover that my current doubts were not something permanent, but an illusion generated by the strains of clerical life. At the end of 1963, I received permission from Pope Paul VI to return to the lay state. But I did not continue long as a Catholic layman. I soon found it impossible to be both a liberal and a Catholic. Shortly after laicization, I had to review a book written by a group of liberal Catholics criticizing a number of Catholic beliefs and practices. <clears throat> In the course of the review, review, I wrote, let us suppose that the Vatican Council were to declare that despite past teaching, artificial contraception is not intrinsically immoral. How could the Church ever be taken seriously again as a moral authority. If a doctrine taught so solemnly, and at the cost of much suffering, if it can turn out to be mistaken, what reliance can be placed on any other moral doctrine? If the use of contraceptives is ever permissible, it's surely often obligatory, and in that case, <coughs> many of the faithful must have been kept for years from the performance of their duty by the teaching of the church. If these authors are in the right, I wrote, then at any time during the last 50 years, a man would have been morally and religiously better off outside the church than within it. For as a result of being Catholic, he's been seriously misinformed about the nature of marriage, about the authority of the Bible, about the place of the church and the sacraments, and about the justice and judgments of God. And if this is so, what rational ground has anyone for being a Roman Catholic at all? <coughs> My own formal departure from the church came when I, a couple of years after I ceased to be a priest, I got married without a papal dispensation. That, <coughs> at the time, involved an automatic excommunication. Well, I've respected the excommunication in the sense that I've never since taken communion or approached the sacrament. Equally, whenever I attend a Christian Eucharist, I refuse to recite the creed. To, to, to take the sacrament would be to affront an institution I respect, and to recite the creed would be a piece of hypocrisy. In the 1970s, many ex-priests received permission from Rome to marry or had their marriages recognized by the Curia. I never wished for this because, however much the pendulum of belief and disbelief might swing within my mind, I could never again imagine accepting the infallible authority of the Church and the full panoply <coughs> of Catholic teaching. <coughs> Now, more than 50 years on, I find that one of the things for which I am grateful to the Church is the very notion of a moral system. On individual moral issues, I sometimes agree with its teachings and sometimes disagree. For instance, I think it's been fundamentally wrong to oppose contraception and fundamentally right in opposing abortion. But I accept the principle that there are some things that one should never do 
no matter what are the consequences of abstaining. This notion, which I first learned from the church, is in contrast with the prevailing utilitarianism of our time. According to utilitarianism, the morality of actions should be judged by their foreseen consequences. According, again, to utilitarianism, there's no category of act which may not, in special circumstances, be justified by its consequences. We may divide uh, moral philosophers into absolutists and consequentialists. Absolutists believe that there are some kinds of action that are intrinsically wrong and should never be done, irrespective of any consideration of consequences. Consequentialists believe that the morality of actions should be judged by their consequences and that there's no category of act which may not, in special circumstances, be justified by its consequences. My own position remains absolutist, no less than that of the Catholic Church. Though I accept the structure of morality that I was taught in use, I no longer believe in its being underpinned by a system of divine commands and prohibitions. Religious believers do not seem to be able to agree among themselves which are the actions that God has prohibited absolutely. And for philosophical reasons, I can no longer accept the parallel between God and human legislators. Well, I may be asked, where then do these absolute prohibitions on certain actions come from? Can there be a prohibition without a prohibitor? Do not those who believe that some kinds of action are absolutely ruled out, don't they merely echo the prejudices of their upbringing? The answer to the question is to be found in the nature of morality itself. Uh, if you're following the handout, you'll see we're up to number four. There are three elements that are essential to morality. A moral community, a set of moral values, and a moral code. All three are necessary. First, it is as impossible to have a purely private morality as it is to have a purely private language, and for very similar reasons. Secondly, the moral life of the community consists in the shared pursuit of non-material values, such as fairness, truth, comradeship, freedom, <coughs> equality. It's the nature of the values pursued that distinguishes morality from economics. And thirdly, <coughs> this pursuit of values is carried out within a framework which excludes certain prohibited types of behaviour. It's this that distinguishes morality from aesthetics, which is also a pursuit of non-material values. And the answer to the question, who does the prohibiting, is that it is the members of the moral community themselves. Membership of a moral, common moral society involves subscription to a common code. The moral community creates moral laws in a manner similar to that in which the linguistic community creates the rules of grammar and syntax. Immanuel Kant expressed this uh, in a picturesque manner with his notion of the kingdom of ends, the kingdom in which <coughs> we are all both subjects and legislators. Though I accept the notion of a moral system, I no longer accept unquestioningly the particular elements that Catholics incorporate into their system. I suppose that it is in the area of sex that official Catholic morality is most widely criticised. Christians in many ages have urged that since the biological purpose of sex is procreation, it's a sin against the author of nature 
to indulge in non-procreative sex. But in fact, in the case of sex, there can be no simple identification of the biologically effective with the morally permissible. St. Paul, in his discussion in uh, Corinthians, does not make any link between marital ethics and procreation. He presents marriage simply as a concession to the strength of sexual desire. The principal source of Catholic sexual morality is not the New Testament, but St. Augustine. In one way, this is appropriate, since among the Church Fathers and the scholastic theologians, Augustine was almost alone in actually having had sexual experience. On the other hand, it's hard to see why his views on sex should deserve great respect, given the way he treated the women in his life. He lived for many years with a concubine by whom he had an illegitimate son. Eventually he dumped her, depriving her of her son, in order to be married to an heiress, whom in due course he jilted in her turn. Repenting of his past, Augustine as bishop regarded sex as permissible only in marriage and treated procreation as the uh, principal purpose of marriage. But he conceded, uh, nonetheless, that the desire to procreate uh, is not the only legitimate motive for marriage. <clears throat> he did not condemn intercourse after childbearing age as being actually sinful. Hence he rejected the idea that sex can lawfully be indulged only in ways conformable to the biological teleology of the generative organs. Nowadays, there are two dominant contrasting patterns of sexual morality. Christian fundamentalists, and not only in the Catholic Church, define a large number of sexual activities as intrinsically sinful. In my view, it's wrong to regard sexual ethics as a matter of laying down rules regulating the types of sexual activity that are permissible. It's not like the way that one can specify the positions and motions which will make a player offside uh, in football. In this area, as in many others, the appropriate approach, in my view, is not via the notion of law, but via the notion of virtue, in this case, the virtue of chastity. This doesn't mean that there are no such things as wrong sexual acts. Most obviously, rape is one of the worst of human acts because it's a violation of the sexual integrity of an unconsenting partner. At the opposite extreme is the common secular position that everything is permitted in sex, whether solitary or between partners of either gender. The only moral constraint on sexual activity, according to this view, is the consent of any partner that may be involved. And for this reason, the one form of sex that is universally abhorred is paedophilia, where the sexual partner, by reason of age, is incapable of the appropriate informed consent. I would maintain <coughs> that the irrational sexual ethic lies in the mean between the regulatory code of the Puritan and the free-for-all of the Libertine. What should be the guiding principle of morality in this area? As we have seen, it's not possible to determine sexual ethics by closely linking sexual activity solely to its procreative potential. <clears throat> the division of sexual acts into natural and unnatural was undermined long ago by nature itself when, month by month, it separated human sexual desire from human fertility and marked out humankind from the animals who mate only when the female is on heat. Within the contemporary social and technological context, I would argue, chastity is best understood as the maintenance of the link, not between sex and procreation, but between sex and love. Because love is the most profound of human values, 
and sex the most intense of human pleasures, it is important that the two should, wherever possible, go hand in hand. Promiscuity is bad not only because of the dangers it presents of unwanted pregnancies and sexually transmitted diseases, but because it devalues sex by separating it from love. Whether the partners in a sexual union love or try to love each other is more important than whether they are of the same or different sex. Experience shows that there may be deeper love in a homosexual union than in many heterosexual marriages. And one of the cruelest forms that human folly has taken was the centuries-long practice of imprisoning, or indeed burning, those convicted of sodomy. Having said that, however, I do not welcome the recent introduction of homosexual marriage in several countries. It's true that <coughs> the original purpose of marriage has been downgraded in contemporary culture, but until recently it remained an institution whose <coughs> primary purpose was to provide a stable context for the procreation and education of children. The introduction of uh, homosexual marriage shifts the center of gravity of the institution from uh, <coughs> the children to the sexual companionship of the adults. I am myself the product of a single parent family and was brought up by two women, but I haven't been able to find evidence that children brought up in such households or within single sex unions are likely to turn out just as well as those brought up within a happy marriage. And in objecting to homosexual marriage, I find myself again on the same side as the Catholic Church, even though such marriage has recently been legalized in Ireland, once the most loyally Catholic country in Europe. However, I don't admire the Church's management of the heterosexual marriages of its members. In particular, the Church's absolute prohibition on remarriage after divorce. I don't intend to enter into the um, general issue of uh, the arguments for and against the legalization of divorce. My objection is to the actual current practice of the Church in this respect. The Church has always allowed married couples to separate from each other when they find it impossible to live together. That's what he did in the case of my own parents. And of course, the separation of parents has very similar sad effects on children as divorce does. Most secular jurisdictions, and some religious ones, recognize this and allow at least one member of the separated couple to be married, thereby providing the children with a step-parent and the possibility of further siblings, as well as providing marital companionship for the separated spouse. In practice, many of the clergy recognize the advantages of allowing a separated spouse to remarry while the original partner <coughs> is still alive. But instead of accepting these advantages as making a case for the legalization of divorce, the authorities have insisted that individual cases should be dealt with by an annulment of the original marriage. The result has been an expansion of the number of marriages alone and a widening of the grounds for annulment. I have witnessed cases in which what appeared a perfectly valid, if unhappy, marriage was set aside on very flimsy evidence of original lack of consent. And the effect of annulment, of course, is to bastardize the children of the first marriage. A motu proprio of Pope Francis, Metis Judex Dominus Jesus, seems to encourage this practice of offering annulment as a substitute for divorce. It allows for a shorter annulment procedure and lists a number of novel grounds for calling the validity of a marriage into question, including 
the continuance of an extramarital relationship, the concealment of a prison sentence, or the desire to make an honest woman of an already pregnant partner. It's unsurprising that conservative Catholics have complained that this makes the validity of marriage dependent on the moral state of the bride and bridegroom, who are the ministers of the sacrament. As long as the church refuses formally <clears throat> to accept the possibility of divorce, it will have to deal with the problem of the pastoral treatment of those who have remarried after a civil divorce. In consistency, such couples must be considered adulterers and debarred from the Eucharist unless there is a change in the teaching that only those in a state of grace may receive communion. Pope Francis has shown himself obviously unhappy with this situation, but the final document of his Synod on the Family shows that he's failed to persuade <coughs> the majority of bishops to make any unambiguous change to the present discipline, and insofar as he encourages any change, it is only in an ambiguous footnote. <coughs> we are now um, up to point nine. More important than sexual morality are the issues concerned with the taking of the life of a human being. At the present time, the differences between Catholic teaching and much secular morality concern the point at which the protection of individual human life should begin and end. Most Catholics nowadays regard individual human life as beginning at conception. An embryo, they claim, from the first moment of its existence has the potential to become a rational human being and therefore should be allotted full human rights. To be sure, an embryo cannot think or reason or exhibit any of the other activities that define rationality, but neither can a newborn baby. The protection that we afford to infants shows that we accept that it's potentiality rather than actuality that determines the conferment of human rights. But through most of the history of Western Christianity, the majority opinion has been that individual human life begins only at some time after conception. <clears throat> In the terminology that for centuries seemed natural, the ensoulment of the individual could be dated at a certain period after the intercourse that produced the offspring. Among Christian thinkers, the general consensus was that the human soul was directly created by God and it was infused into the embryo when the form of the body was completed. And that was generally held to occur around 40 days after conception. It was Martin Luther who first made popular the idea that individual human life begins at conception itself. <coughs> Undoubtedly, there is an uninterrupted history of development linking conception with the eventual life of the adult. But the line of development from conception through fetal life is not the interrupted history of an individual, not the uninterrupted history <coughs> of an individual. A cell that will become a human being, an embryo or conceptus will do so within 14 days. If it's not implanted within 14 days, it will never have a birth. And up to that stage, it's still uncertain whether an embryo will divide into one or more individuals. Only around the 14th day does true individual development begin. In its early days, a single zygote may turn into something that's not a human being at all, or something that is one human being, or something that is two people or more. Fetus, child and adult have a continuous individual development which gamete and zygote do not. To count embryos is not the same as to count human beings. In my view, the balance of the argument 
lead us to place the individuation of the human being somewhere around the 14th day of pregnancy. But there are two sides to the reasoning that leads to that conclusion. If the course of development of the embryo gives good reason to believe that <coughs> uh, before the 14th day it's not an individual human being, but it gives equally good reason to believe that after that time it is an individual human being. And if so, <coughs> late abortion is indeed homicide, and abortion becomes late at quite an early date. Since what happens in abortion clinics takes place well after the stage at which the embryo has become an individual human being, it may seem that philosophical and theological argument about the moment of ensoulment has little practical moral relevance. But that's not so. If the life of an individual human begins at conception, then all practices which involve the deliberate destruction of embryos uh, deserves condemnation. And that's why there's been official Catholic opposition to various forms of IVF and to scientific research involving stem cells. But if the embryo in its earliest days is not yet an individual human being, then it need not necessarily be immoral to sacrifice it to the greater good of actual human beings who wish to conceive a child or reap the benefits of medical research. <coughs> uh, well, that concludes uh, point nine. <coughs> I turn now from the question of the inception of human life to the issues surrounding the termination of life by human agency. Until the last century, most Christian theologians accepted that the state had the right to take the life of one of its citizens <clears throat> as a punishment for crime. Nowadays, capital punishment has been outlawed in most countries in Europe, and its retention in the United States is condemned by many Christian moralists, including recently Pope Francis. In a recent issue of the Tablet, Chris Patton pointed out the extraordinary irony that when now for the first time the United States Supreme Court has a majority of Catholics among its members, its decisions on <coughs> capital punishment are directly at com in conflict with papal guidance. I do not myself accept the argument that capital punishment is absolutely wrong <coughs> and involves doing evil that good may come. Anyone who is not a pacifist must accept that the deliberate taking of human life may sometimes be lawful. If a national community may in a just war lawfully take the life of citizens of other states, it's hard to see why it's absolutely prohibited from taking the life of one of its own citizens. To be sure, human life is more important than any human property, so if capital punishment is to be justified, it must be used only as a punishment for murder and not for lesser crimes <coughs> such as theft. And undoubtedly, the way in which murder sentences are carried out in practice in some American states constitutes cruel and unusual punishment of an atrocious kind. The strongest argument against capital punishment is that given the fallibility of judges and juries, it's possible that from time to time, <coughs> innocent people will be wrongly executed. The strongest argument in favor of capital punishment is that uh, without it, society has no further sanction, uh, sorry, has no sanction against further taking of life by murderers already serving in prison. It would be possible to do justice to both arguments by a legal system that allowed the death penalty to be imposed only after the second of two independent convictions for murder. I turn, finally, to the authority claimed for the Pope as head of the Church. 
Historically, this rests on dubious foundations. The inscription around the dome of the Vatican Basilica claims that the authority is based on the words of Jesus in St. Matthew's Gospel, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. But even if we accept St. Matthew's account without question, it's difficult to have confidence in the link between St. Peter and the popes of subsequent ages, given the lack of any serious evidence that St. Peter was ever Bishop of Rome, or indeed a bishop at all. Of course, any serious person, secular or religious, must respect the Pope as the re religious leader of a large proportion of the world's population. But his title to authority within the Church and respect outside it must rest not so much on a partly legendary historical pedigree, but upon the consent of those he governs. And this consent in recent years seemed to have been considerably weakened. Many, even Catholics, <coughs> whose religious observance is exemplary, call in question papal teaching on important moral issues. Today, no less than at the time of the Second Vatican Council, I find it difficult to make logical sense of the position of such liberal Catholic dissidents. All that has changed since then is that the list of Catholic teachings, which many Catholics find abhorrent, is now much longer than it was then, including the condemnation of homosexuality, the role assigned to women, and even the prescription of abortion. But it's not only traditional moral teaching that is disowned by many Catholics. So too is the doctrine, which if it is true, is the strongest possible reason for being a Catholic in the first place, <clears throat> namely the doctrine that membership of the church is the only way to save one's soul and avoid an eternity of damnation in hell. Jesus taught straight as the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Saint Augustine interpreted this and other texts as meaning that the human race was a massa damnata, a mass of damnation, out of which only a few elect were predestined and chosen to be saved and go to heaven. And in 1302, Pope Boniface VIII concluded his bill, Unam Sanctum, with the words, we declare, say, define and proclaim to every human creature that if they are to be saved, they must of necessity be subject to the Roman pontiff. If Boniface VIII marks the high point of papal claims to ecclesiastical supremacy, <coughs> Pius IX marks the high point of papal claims to doctrinal authority. 1870 was the year in which the first Vatican Council defined papal infallibility. <coughs> exactly a hundred years later, Hans Kuhn published a book with the title Infallible Astronaut, a book that called in question the scriptural and ecumenical foundation for papal infallibility. An attack on church infallibility might seem to be of little interest to anyone except Roman Catholics, since no one else has ever believed the doctrine. But in fact, the issue of infallibility has a much wider significance, because if a church claims infallibility, it rules out for itself the possibility of correcting past mistakes. Indeed, when the doctrine was first mooted in the 14th century, the Pope of the day, John XXII, is said to have denounced it as a pestiferous doctrine because it would prevent him from overruling decisions of his predecessors. Those who dislike the First Vatican Council's definition of papal infallibility often comfort themselves with the thought that it was softened down at the Second Council. In fact, the scope of infallibility was widened rather than narrowed when Second Vatican defined without discussion 
that the ordinary magisterium of bishops was infallible. There's one passage in the Second Vatican Council which apparently extends infallibility even further than the bishops. I quote, the whole body of the faithful, anointed as they are by the Holy One, cannot err in matters of belief and manifests this reality in the supernatural sense of the face of the whole people when, from the bishops to the last of the lay faithful, they show their total agreement in matters of faith and morals. That passage can be taken in two ways. It may mean that the members of the laity are infallible when, and only when, they totally agree with what the bishops have said. Or it might conceivably mean that the bishops are infallible only if the laity agree with them. And in a recent address, Pope Francis startlingly appeared to take it in the second sense. He told an assembly of bishops that the people were infallible in matters of belief, and he compared the church's structure to an upside-down pyramid with the people at the top, and then the priests and the bishops and the pope at the bottom. <coughs> Whatever this may portend for the future of the doctrine of infallibility, it's worth noting that since 18, it was defined in 1870, the charisma has very rarely been invoked. It seems to be the spiritual equivalent of the hydrogen bomb, a weapon so powerful as to be unusable in practice. It has never been used to settle live disputes within the church. Even Pope John Paul II, who was anxious to end once for all the movement for women priests, he hesitated to claim uh, that he was speaking with full ex cathedra authority when he declared the priesthood to be an irrevocably male preserve. One of the main objections to the doctrine of infallibility is that it stands in the way of ecumenism and the reunification of Christian churches. The most important current obstacle to such reunion is precisely that of the ordination of women as priests and bishops. Conservative Catholics present this as a matter of doctrine rather than discipline, but only by the argument that since all the apostles were male, only males can be priests. This is no more convincing than a parallel argument that since St. Peter was married, only married men can be popes. Uh, there's a devout American Catholic, Gary Wills, who has written a book called Papal Sin. And he criticizes many Catholic doctrines on the grounds that many items of teaching continue, even though the original reasons in support of them have been given up. What is deceitful, he says, is the substitution of new and usually incredible arguments to shore up conclusions detached from their original premises. For instance, over the centuries, two reasons were given for excluding women from the priesthood, that they were inferior beings, unworthy to hold that dignity, and that they should not approach the altar because of their ritual impurity. Neither of these positions would be defended by the church today, and thus bizarre symbolic reasons are dreamt up for restricting the priesthood to males. And the primary reason for this, Gary Wills argues, is to avoid the loss of face in changing the rule. I turn finally to the topic of the scale of priestly abuse of minors revealed by recent inquiries and the scandal of the attempts by church authorities to cover up these crimes. The root cause of this, I believe, is the clericalism instilled in senior seminarians, giving them the idea that the clergy are different from and superior to the laity. If clericalism is to be overcome, in my view, the whole seminary system needs overhaul. The institution of seminaries by the Council of Trent was a useful reform. It meant that 
counter-Reformation clergy were on the whole better educated and better behaved than their late medieval predecessors. <coughs> but the institution was appropriate to cultures where most of the laity were illiterate and the priests might be one of the few educated people in the parish. It's not similarly appropriate in a world where parishioners may well be better educated than their parish priests. I think the present system is totally dysfunctional as a preparation for parochial ministry, which I could illustrate not only from my own experience, but from that of many of my former classmates and colleagues. <coughs> Junior seminaries of the kind I attended seem to be fading out. But it is senior seminaries that instill the ideas that the clergy are a race apart and above the ordinary layman. To prevent such <coughs> clericalism, I think it would be better if future priests were selected from adult laymen and more to the point women who have experience of the world and of other careers. Those who volunteer should then be submitted to a year or two of special training before they are ordained and sent into a parish. Of course, I have no hope that such a scheme will be adopted. Some of my friends tell me that since I'm no longer a card-carrying member of the church, its arrangements are none of my business. <laughs> I quite disagree. The church is such a powerful international organization that every person on the globe has an interest in its functioning effectively, <coughs> transparently, and honestly. And in spite of its failings, <coughs> I continue to believe that it is mainly a force for the good. Thank you.